Well, this is an interesting format. So here goes. I'm uh, going to talk about community democratic development this evening and making board work matter. And this is what I'm going to talk about. Why is it, as a culture, and probably not the people who are in this room right now, you're here because you're keen, you'll sit and watch a 20-minute TED Talk, you'll watch five or six of them in a row, but all around us are people that have about 10 or 15 or 20 things they'd rather be doing than go to a board meeting. Why does board work deserve our creative and heartfelt attention? What's at stake if we continue to disengage from this kind of work? And a bit of a discussion about how we might ignite some passion and interest in local board engagement. Why are we board adverse? When I was putting together a TED talk, people said, what are you going to talk about? And there was lots of topics. I'm involved in the arts and a festival downtown where we're you know, uh, taking over the commons and creating a free art and culture experience. I've been involved in the environmental movement. When I said I'm going to do a talk about boards, people started to glaze over before I even went any more into the conversation. <laughs> How are you going to make that interesting? I I'm not even sure I can. I think we're stuck, first of all, with a word whose very meaning is to be, <laughs> well, you know. The language of board work, the location of boards, the physical demands, and by that I mean the sitting on your butt all day, the processes like things like Robert's Rules of Order, the tools we use, the rituals, professional board members, lifers, the ones who are entrenched in our organizations, in our community, and in communities all over the world, the rhetoric, the language that you only know if you're involved in the inside club, all of these things are deterrents for building a culture of board engagement. This is what a board meeting looks like. The shot's about, I don't know, 70 years ago. And well, there's another one. This one was from about the 1920s, and this was 1958. I know that, and it looks the same. We've been sitting and doing our community processes the same way, around the same circle, probably since King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, or before that, except that at some point, sitting in a circle was a thing that we did because it would help us to make decisions together in this really beautiful way. But instead, it's become sort of this container that traps us and it looks the same way that it's looked for hundreds and hundreds of years. Think about how we talk about being on boards. Again, I'm speaking to a room of people who are engaged and community aware and tuned in and probably are sitting on boards, but still, when we leave for our meeting, we'll all be inclined to say, oh, I have a board meeting tonight. Oh, I can't do that, I have to sit through a board meeting. Or friends who say, I'll do anything for you, but just don't ask me to come to meetings. Everybody got friends like that? Why on earth would I spend free time doing that? I'd rather be gardening. <laughs> it's not exactly a way that we think about creative, dynamic, exciting ways to spend our time. And this is something that we need to seriously look at. It's also a natural state for a board to reinforce its own existence. So while boards have an opportunity to be these change-making places, which I'll talk about a little bit later, the very nature of a board doesn't want to change. We're not really good at being involved in processes that, I don't know, lead to our own destruction. But if you think about the types of things that boards are involved in and the work that they're doing, and we'll get into it, but the advocacy, environmental, social justice, it would make sense that one would hope that a board would work itself out of existence at some point. But instead, we have entrenchment, and we have these concerns and fears about massive change, or about changing direction, or about ripping open a constitution and re-examining an mission that may no longer serve the purpose of an organization. We're creatures of habit, and the risk takers among us tend to be the ones that are heading to the mountains and not the boardroom. So why do I think board work deserves our creative and heartfelt attention? Um, some of you may know I do board development consulting. And when I walk into the room, one of the first things that I'm trying to do is get the people who are sitting at that table to feel, I don't know, excited about the work they're doing. Usually it's about 20% of the group that has experience doing board work. And the other 80%, when you ask who taught you how to be a board member, they have no answer. Someone talked them into coming to the table, someone talked them into joining that board, and then the entrenchment and the status quo continued with those people sitting at the table. And this is going on around us all over the place. Boards, community boards, manage our commons, and they birth policy change at the most grassroots level. 
Now, when I say they manage the commons or they birth policy, what does that mean? What are the tangible examples? There's a list. These are community-based boards in our community and in communities all over the island, British Columbia, and the world who deal with things like our art galleries, festivals, community gardens, schools, BMX tracks, environmental organizations, community colleges. I could go through the whole list. You can read it. This is a huge piece of our community. It's a huge piece of work that is done by a very small group of people. And it's the only place where we actually can practice the skills that we need to meaningfully engage in democracy. The reason why I think boards are important is because democracy is a lot more than showing up on election day for those who do. But boards are actually one of the containers of democracy. We all know that the family is a small container. Our relationships and our family are that smallest where we work through our power dynamics, we make decisions, we make plans and dreams and goals together and we fulfill them. But the next one out is the community-based board where we practice these skills. And of course, when you ripple out from there, you get to municipal and regional government, provincial government, federal governments, global governments. Where else are we gonna practice these skills and transcend the power relationships that we have in the home and in the family and our relationships into things that are gonna help change the world? Where else do we learn to work together for our collective interests? We're really good at talking about the way things aren't working. We're really good at posting little Facebook pictures about the problems and what's going on, but we really, as a culture, lack the skills for getting together to actually work out solutions. We don't learn this in school, we don't learn this through the media, and we don't learn it in school, and we don't learn it on Facebook. Petitions, another example of something that we think that we can use to create change in the world, a thousand likes, these things don't change policy. So what's at stake? I believe if we don't use it, we're going to lose it. What's at stake with um, the devolution of our engagement in board work is, to, is the erosion of the commons. The things that are still left in the ownership or left in the stewardship of our communities as a whole and our planet as a whole. It's our streets and our highways. And many of these things are straddling a very, very fine line between still being in the commons and being in the hands of someone else. Our schools, our parks, cultural facilities, water, power, air. Whoop. <laughs> there we go backwards. We're also eroding our capacity. We're not even starting with building our capacity to influence and shape policy. We have conversations around our table around what we think the world should look like. We have conversations at a party about what we think the world should look like. And then we have people elected at municipal, provincial, and federal levels that are to make policy. And then we have lobbyists that are paid by corporations. There's a gap in there somewhere where policy development can take place. And again, that's board work within our communities. I also think that what's at stake, and this is because I was talking about this containers of democracy, is a continued erosion of our engagement in democracy. 52%. I think everyone this week knows what that number represents. And although I don't have the 2013 graph to add to this, this is the state of voter engagement in British Columbia. So I think that there's a direct relationship between our disinterest and, dare I say, distaste of board work and our engagement in other layers of democracy. We're in a place where we're risking losing our power and losing our voice in policy decisions that affect our lives and our planet. And the less that we engage in board work, advocacy work, community organizing work, the more we hand over that policy shaping influence to lobbyists and to the owners. The other thing that's at stake or that we risk is the bureaucratization of those institutions in our community. I apologize for the rhetoric. But the things in our community that matter the most to us, if we move away the governance or stewardship of them, then we start to paint a broad brush across all of our communities instead of honoring and recognizing the unique character of each community because it's that unique character and that creativity that will feed into problem solving and new ideas about transforming the world that we live in. So the question is, is there a better narrative possible? The narrative right now is, I hate board meetings. I have other things I'd rather spend my time doing. I have a garden to attend to. And your garden's important. 
but maybe we can start to move, maybe we can start to embrace some of those concepts, that, the, the good ones that live in some of those more archaic community institutions. Rotary is really good at talking about what service is about and its inherent meaning. Service is a privilege and not an obligation. Maybe we can start talking about the idea of board work actually having influence in the development of policy instead of it being a place where we burn time, waste time, or spin our wheels. Maybe it's time for a serious rebrand. Got to come up with a better word than strategic planning, board orientation. If you have any ideas, I welcome them because I think we need to start to really address the language because the language around our work as boards is one of the alienating principles that are in play. It serves to entrench the power of people who get off on bureaucratic terms, and it serves to exclude people for whom that language isn't accessible and doesn't inspire the heart or passions. And it's time to start to think about boards as places where we actually craft and design and the world that we desire. It's a place where we can experiment. It's sort of a low-risk experimental place, you know? There's no question period where they're going to watch the debate. It's a place where you could say, what happens if we were to advocate for a particular type of policy? Or what happens if we were to dream up a particular project like taking over the streets of our community? And it's a place where we can create a narrative where governance is celebrated and planning processes are fun. It's about taking the OCP meetings out of a fluorescent lit boardroom in Cumberland or at the regional district. Or it's a place where governance is celebrated, where there are countries around the world where on election day it's a national holiday and people celebrate and have a party and honor the fact and celebrate the fact that they have um, this responsibility and celebrate this fact that they are actively engaged in the decision making and the, uh, and, and the governance of the land in which they live. Boards could be the place where we practice the change we wish to see in our communities and in the world. It could move it away from the conversation of wouldn't it be cool if to these small entities where we actually practice and experiment with the world that we want to see. Board work could be embraced as exciting work where we experiment, learn skills, build relationships, because we don't know how to do that, and have the courage to imagine our organizations and our institutions. An alternate future, as in other words, an alternate future to the one we're heading towards, will rely on all of us being willing to articulate and commit ourselves to that future. And articulating it is really important because it's about setting the vision that exists way out here, but also articulating how you get to that vision, bridging the gap between the world that we dream of, the communities that we dream of, the policies that we dream of, and actually teaching each other through our work how to take the steps to get there, bridging the gap. <laughs> My utopian fantasies manifested. This needs to be done in our community and with other living, breathing human beings and not just in front of our computer terminals. I'm concerned that our political engagement at the computer screen, while potent for an exchange of information, is actually part of the whole um, error in polling that just occurred going into a recent election. Because we're spending a lot of time indicating our interests and indicating our preferences, but not actually acting on or manifesting them. We're creating a false dialogue. It's a tool, but to use that tool in absence of authentic and real relationships with other human beings will be at our peril. So I took, grabbed a picture of a bunch of people sitting under a tree. And for those of you that have been on boards with me recently, and there's a few of you in the room, I have pleaded to get us outside into the forest for a meeting. I want to get us outside of boardrooms and board tables. I don't want to sit anymore. I've been serving on boards for almost 20 years of my life, and I'm more interested in governance and board work than I've ever been before, and I am more interested in seeing it completely tossed out of the boardroom than I've ever been before. It is time for us to work together to develop the tools to actually implement policy change at the grassroots level in our communities and not to look to those outer containers to do the work because we need to develop our skills with those inner containers so that we can become the people who are making that change. And more than ever, we need to model this and share this, I believe, with young people in our community because more and more we are seeing ourselves as distanced, dis distanced from these bizarre human beings who serve 
in higher levels of political office. And we all know who we're talking about right now. <laughs> But there are also wonderful people serving in office, and those are some of the people that can help us bridge the gaps. But we need to ask them also to look back into the communities and look back into the language and the rhetoric and the terms and the tools that they're using in their governance of our local communities and ask them to revisit that and re-examine it in a way that is going to open the door to youth engagement, that is going to open the door to people who think boards suck, and that's going to open the door to people who don't believe that you can affect policy change at the grassroots level. So, in closing, <laughs> I'd like to come up with a way to make people excited about being on boards. 19 minutes to do it here. I'm still on a journey of transforming language that's so deeply ingrained into my own lexicon that it's hard for me not to become a bore. But if we all did it together and we all started to experiment with the way that we talk about the roles that boards play in our community, I believe and hope that will have a positive impact on our engagement in democracy. And I sincerely hope so, so that we can manifest this world we all dream that can be. Thank you.